For some reason, I cannot get my Bluetooth to pair with uh, the computer. The uh, computer. Do you have your Bluetooth connected to your phone? Oh, well, maybe. Oh. Turn it off. Disconnect it from your phone. Phone instead of my computer. No, but my closed caption in it is on. Yeah, I just put it on because I'm recording. Wait, quick. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's me. All right. Okay, I'll start talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's, That's okay. Nice. This is a this is a you know friendly event. So good evening, everyone. I'm so happy that you are here joining us. I am Linda Miller, the the founder of the Abbott Readers Unite Book Club. And this is our second conversation with author Dalton Price. He has allowed us to, to use his book, The Guide to Community Policing 3.0, as a four-part book series. So we're happy that we have author Dalton Price on and he agreed to this. So we've had great conversations and I look forward to all the conversations that we're gonna have. So Dalton, if you can just, you know, introduce yourself a little bit. Sure, uh, my name is Dalton Price. I am a retired Lieutenant from the Patterson Police Department. I retired from the Internal Affairs Division. I was in the policing, division, policing department for 25 years. I served patrol, street crimes, numerous task force, county task force, state police task force, um, I was assigned to the prosecutor's office gang unit, state police gang unit, and I guess the most important for me was the Patterson Police Community Policing Division, where I learned a lot and I dealt with the community more. And I guess when you look at protect and serve, when you're on the community policing division, you're doing more serving than protecting, mm -hmm. but you're in both roles. So I guess if you wanted to characterize police, you could use some officers are protecting and serving and some are serving and protecting, okay. but they will both get done at the same time. So that, that's a good way of looking at policing in general. But um, that's where I spent my time. Now I'm retired and teaching and spending time on Zoom, have an open dialogue about um, reimagining policing, reimagining our communities and dealing with, or talking about how we're dealing with each other Okay. Not just as police, but as people first, and then we can deal with each other professionally. Awesome, awesome. So tonight, part one, the title is Coptics versus Optics. Now I took that from your book, and in the book, you define Coptics as policing in the digital age. So, you know, everyone's all over social media, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, and all these other um, ways that you're on, you're able to connect with people digitally. And then so Coptics is how we see the cops. That's what you write in your book. And then optics is how people see each other. So the, the topic Coptics versus optics, how come seeing the cops and seeing the residents, how come it's not the same look? So tonight is really about perception. So can it's, you go we, a little we, deeper into that? Sure, we, we sit in two different places and it's the view that people have of things that bother them. And that's whether it's the police or the community. It's the view that they have. And when they sit in a certain place from where you stand, things look differently. Mm -hmm. And I use as an analogy in a meeting, I took a coffee cup and I put the letter A on one side and the B on the other side. And I asked the person across the table, what letter is on the cup? And they said A and I said B. And we kept arguing what letter was on the cup. And I turned the cup around and the person says, well, I didn't see that side of the cup before. And that is the point. Mm. That is the point. We don't always see it from the view that the other person has. So as police officers, we have to change where we do things because the coptics is, this could have happened for anyone else, it would have been fine. But because you're a police officer in uniform, Different. it doesn't look right. And you have to be mindful of those things that other people can do that you can't do as a police officer. You have to know that in the digital age, you're making an arrest. And at one time, you make an arrest. And by the time you finish the report, the arrest itself was on social media. Right. Now, the arrest is on social media before you leave the scene. It's right. on Facebook Live. So you have to be careful about your tactics, make sure you're doing the right thing. And then you have to look at your tactics afterwards. Right. See, did I do the right thing? And then look at it and say, how did it look? 
Right. I may not have done anything wrong, mm -hmm. but I can see the way the other person would look at it. Right. And, and that's where the conversation comes in, being open to the conversation and listening to someone else to say, I could see their mm -hmm. viewpoint. I could see why you would think that, but that's not what happened. That's not um, what I did, or more importantly, let me explain to you why I did what I did. Right, exactly. And I've, I've noticed that things have gotten so tense lately. I believe we were talking the other day and now a, a routine traffic stop is no longer a routine traffic stop between you know the police officer and the residents because now people walk past, they're making sure. They'll go, hey sis, you okay? Everything all right? So now everything could have been fine. It could have been something simple. And now the cop may have gotten a little tension. And then now I may look around like, well, should I be concerned about something? I don't know. Like, so the routine things have now been blown out of proportion because well, of the tensions I, that we have. We don't, we don't like to call a, a motor vehicle stop routine. Oh, okay. But what people call it routine, but we try to get out of that mindset because no stop is routine because you pull a person over for a traffic light violation, you don't know who you're pulling over. Okay. So in your mind, I'm pulling a person over to either give them a ticket or advise them they ran through a light. What I don't know is that that person has a warrant for their arrest mm. and things can go bad. So we don't like to use the term routine, but I do understand your point. Okay. And sometimes you have to, you can't say it to someone, but if an officer is on a motor vehicle stop and he pulls you over, as he pulls you over, he's talking to you and Kareem walks by and she says, um, are you okay? You need anything? And the officer looks at Kareem and says, well, what are you gonna do if she's not okay? <laughs> okay, now he shouldn't say that. That is not the proper thing to say. However, what were you prepared to do? Right. If Linda says, no, I'm not okay. Kareem's gonna go, oh, what do I do? Right. I pull up my phone and record. Okay, but you could have done that Right. without taking the attention away from the officer. Right. Let the officer do his job. You want to record him, record him. Okay, if he does something wrong, you send it to where it needs to go. There's nothing wrong with that. But you don't have to get completely involved. And when I'm on a, an officer on a motor vehicle stop, it's hard for that officer to concentrate on what he's doing when people are around yelling. Okay. And I can guarantee you that the officer could have been pulling you over to give you a warning but once Kareem starts with the, the video camera, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You could be stopping somebody else. Guess yeah. what? Linda's getting a ticket. <laughs> yes. Okay. Linda's getting a ticket. Kareem's going to say that wasn't fair. You didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. But Kareem didn't get the ticket. Right. So it, it, is, it is different now because these stops turn into things. And more times than not, the person may have violated the law. Right. Okay, you violate a traffic law, you get pulled over. Now is not the time to say, you got nothing better to do. <laughs> okay, there's people dealing drugs and this and that, you got nothing. Now is not the time for that because you're working where you are. This is what I'm doing right now. I'm doing traffic stops and your sticker is three months old. Mm. And, and the other side is we used to get phone calls from people that would say, I got pulled over by the police. I did run the stop sign. Okay, I, I did it. I apologized to the officer. I was wrong, but he still gave me a ticket. Right. And they think that's wrong. Being nice and apologizing to the officer doesn't change the fact that you did violate the law. Right. And one officer may give you the ticket. The other one may not give you the ticket. So you like the one that didn't give you the ticket, yes. but you think the one that gave you the ticket <laughs> is wrong. So mm -hmm. this, this is just our opinion right. about the situation and, and the police have the same issue and it goes, it goes both ways. Right. So our opinions are actually kind of guiding our relationship and not the facts of what's really happening. Do you agree or, or it, don't agree? It can because you're taking other people's opinion about other situations and you're putting yourself in a situation that maybe you're not in. Right. Okay. And, and I'll use a perfect example and I'll change the analogy. Okay. A white person driving through a black community because of everything that's going on, they get pulled over. And when the black cop stops them, they turn to the officer and says, did you pull me over just because I'm white driving through a black community? Mm. And that's the attitude that people give. And it happens on both sides. Right. And the officer says, no, I pulled you over because you got a tail light out. Mm. Well, you got nothing better to do. You know, there's drugs all over this city. And <laughs> you're probably getting a ticket. 
Okay, because mm -hmm. you didn't have to talk to the officer that way. And okay. again, we're talking about one side of it. Right, exactly. We're still talking about the person in the car. We're not talking about when the officer goes off the reservation. Right. This, this is just one side of it right now. Right, and I think that's the problem now. Some officers now, because of the digital age, have been shown now going off the reservation mm -hmm. and then nothing happens. So then the regular officers who are serving, who are doing their job and the residents who are doing their job far as like if there's something going on in the neighborhood, make, maybe making a call, maybe making the, the, um, the police department aware of something that maybe they don't realize because you're not in every neighborhood. Right. You know, we, you're not everywhere. We don't have that many police officers. Half the time, I think they're getting fired because of budget cuts. But, you know, these things I think that um, we have to think about as well. And I think that's where some of the tensions are right now um, because of what we see around the country. And that's why I think we decided when reading your book, I thought this was a perfect time to see how we in our community right now or the you know, neighboring communities could figure out ways in which we could build back the relationship or just build a better relationship you know transparent on both sides well the relationship in from my point of view the police have a great responsibility to build this relationship mm -hmm. and i say that the police have the responsibility because i wouldn't put the onus on someone else okay. to build a relationship okay. okay but as a community member i would say it's the community's job to build a relationship mm -hmm. you know someone would say well how can you do both okay. easy both people in the relationship can work towards making the relationship better let's have dialogue let's talk about what's right and let's talk about what's wrong let's mm -hmm. not be let's not be afraid to say i look at the video and the officer in this case was wrong right but sometimes what happens you look at the video or you see the comments and people say this officer deserves to be fired well i don't know if it needs to go to that extent mm -hmm. okay there's progressive discipline that needs to be done. The officer said the wrong thing or he was nasty. Does he deserve to get fired? Right. You know, if, if he deserves to get fired, does everyone that has a job, if they did the same thing, if they went some kind of violation and they said the wrong thing, should they get fired? No. And that's not always the case. He sometimes, and I've, I've learned it and I've seen it. Progressive discipline goes a long way. Can I've you seen people get- on that? Progressive discipline? What is that? Well, you get, you, you do something wrong, Mm -hmm. and there's a punishment to it okay. but the punishment starts at let's say you get a written warning okay and after the written warning if it happens to get another violation you get three days suspension mm. okay i've seen officers do things that weren't they weren't criminal but they were a policy violation and you may have had a few complaints about the officer so you give him three days suspension okay you think back three four five years have passed and you haven't had one more complaint about that officer Mm. So that's an important conversation because that progressive discipline is what you use for two reasons. One, you use it to change the behavior. And that's what punishment and discipline is about. It's about changing the behavior of the person. Now, if it doesn't change the behavior, now you, your job, and I stole this from someone, your job is to help people be successful. Mm. You be successful here, or I will help you be successful someplace else. Okay. <laughs> okay. Which means either you can keep your job here yes. or you can go somewhere else and get a job. But if you, my job, I will help you be successful. And that's what the point of view comes down to. Okay. Use the progressive discipline. And when you start yelling for a person to be fired over minor discipline, okay. people stop listening. Right. People really stop listening. You know, when you're upset at the young lady at McDonald's because she didn't give you napkins and you tell the manager to fire her, Mm -hmm. The manager is no longer listening to you. Right. Okay. If you tell the manager, listen, you need to, you know, talk to your people so they can make sure that they're giving us napkins when, you know, we're, we're coming to buy stuff. And the manager will say, listen, from now on, make sure you put napkins in the bag, make that a part of your job. And that's, a, that's kind of a warning. It's kind of progressive discipline. But when you say, I want her fired, the manager is no longer listening to you because what right. you're saying doesn't make sense. Right. So you're calling for a discipline that, that, shouldn't be and there has to be it has to be progressive right. depending be depending on the charge right there has to be some middle ground in between that yes and i think it's because we put police officers to a higher standard than many other professions so we expect more from them so let's say a small infraction did happen 
Uh, we, we do want their um, jobs. We want it fired, but that's not the steps in which it happens. Now, and progressive discipline doesn't mean that you are, let's go to the, the highest level. You're involved in a shooting that's obviously wrong. Okay. We're not saying you should get a warning. Okay, we're not saying you should get three days suspension. What we're saying is there are progressive disciplines involved in this process based on what you did. Okay, that's where you talk about progressive discipline. But a written warning for a person who's been late three times mm -hmm. is one situation. Okay. Okay, that's, that's fine. Progressive discipline for an officer who was going to a job and he was driving the vehicle too fast, he ran a red light and had an accident. His, dis his progressive discipline may start with a 10 day suspension. Okay. So it's progressive, but it, and it's always said, the punishment has to fit the crime. Fit the you can't just call for a person's job because they made a mistake. We all make mistakes. We all do dumb things. We all violate our work policies somehow. Right. But you coming back late 15 minutes from lunch doesn't constitute you getting fired. No. Okay, Linda, here's your warning. Okay, it happened once and don't let it happen again. And that's the discipline. So it is, there's different levels of uh, the progressive discipline. Right. So now let's talk about body cams. That's the big thing in a lot of different de police departments around the country. Um, how do you think that that's gonna either um, help or hurt the community? If you look at this Zoom, mm -hmm. okay, everyone here is acting a certain way because they're on camera, Right. okay? Everyone checked their background. Everyone checked, you know, their, their, their skin and everything else. And they checked their nose and make sure before they got on the Zoom, they make sure everything is perfect. And that's what people will do when they know they're being videoed. People would and should act differently. Okay. And it's going to make good people act better. And hopefully it make not so good people act better because you know you're being videoed. So if you're a police officer, and you normally got a sharp tongue. Now you know that you're being video and that ain't the way you should talk to people mm -hmm. because you're being video and it can cost you some money, um, either suspension or something else it can cost you getting, getting your, your position moved. So we'll act differently. Plus the community will act differently when they know they're being video. That's another side of it. People in general act different when they know they're being video. The flip side is when you come in to make a complaint that something was done wrong to your cousin, brother, sister, whoever, and I show you the video, Right. you may look at that video and be like, uh, you know what, uh, disregard. <laughs> I, I understand, I've seen how my brother acted, my sister mm -hmm. acted, but it goes both ways. When you talk about the video, when the person makes the complaint and the officer or, or supervisor wants to see the video and first he may be thinking, well, I know this officer and this officer doesn't act this way. That's not who he is. And then he looks at the video and he says to the mother, um, I see your point okay. and, and we're going to address it. So once that video is shown, the person looking at that video has to be fair by what they see. Right. So I think it will change the way things are done, it, the way things are done. It will change the way people act. It will change, um, the way some adv advocates act once they see the video. Because you go and complain to someone, a council person or a activist in your community about something that happens. And you tell them your version of the story. And that person is allowed to come in and see the video. Right. And once the activist sees the video, they're like, it didn't happen the way they said it happened. Okay. So those are the kind of things that change people's mind. And it's been proven that the departments that have switched to body cameras, the complaints have went down. Okay. Now, some people will argue that the complaints went down because the police stopped beating people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've heard that conversation. I argue against it. Okay. I don't think that's the situation. Okay. We hope but, not. We hope not. <laughs> uh, well, I, I can't say. I hope it's not. But if, if you're that kind of person, if you're that kind of police officer, and if that body camera is what stops you from beating people, then good, you stopped. Right, good for us. Yeah, what, what, yeah whatever stops you from violating people's civil rights, I'm just glad it stopped you. Right. Okay, it shouldn't have took a body camera, but I'm just glad it stopped exactly. you. So that, that's an important part of the conversation. So body cameras to me, 
they're, they're a good tool. They're a good tool all the way around for everyone. Okay, so what do you think about transparency? Are there things that the this, we as residents should know about police actions that is simple things that we should just know that what's going on? So that Absolutely. we're not so um, quick to judge what we may be seeing. We as a population, we're quick to judge. Okay. okay? We don't know. You're, you're riding down the street, minding your business. Okay. You sit at a stoplight. You see a person standing on the corner, minding their business. Right. Three cop cars pull up, jump out, throw the person on the ground, put them in a the car and drive off with them. And what is your view? Oh my goodness. This person didn't do anything. I just seen the cops grab this guy that was minding his business, threw him in the car and took him away. Cops shouldn't be doing that. You have no idea what just happened. Right. Okay. You, you had a very quick view. So what needs to be done is in that situation, you have people who have a really good concern about what happened and they can be told if they inquire. And this is where the police come in. Have conversation with people about some of these things when you can. You can call down and say, listen, I just seen this happen at such and such location. And all you could say is, listen, ma'am, I can't tell you the whole story, but there was an investigation going on and that person was legally arrested. Okay. okay? That's what you can be told because you, your view was very quick. So right. we see things differently. And we had this conversation about what you see versus what the police see because of their job. You may see a bunch of young people hanging on a corner. Right. And should they be there? Maybe, maybe not. But in your view, they're not doing anything wrong. What you don't see is that the drug addict walks up to that crowd and looking to buy drugs. And right. every time they walk up, someone in that crowd says, listen, we don't sell drugs. Okay, you want drugs, you go over to that corner and get drugs. Well, you do that three or four times and there's a surveillance going on. Mm -hmm. You're actually pointing to people where to go and buy drugs and you could become a point, a part of that investigation. But from where Linda stands, you didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. So our view, again, our view of how we take things in and where we see them and how we see them is very important to the conversation but in order to do that, you have to get people to the table and talk about what their concerns are. Let me explain to you why cops do what they do and how they do it. You can disagree, right? let me explain to you. And as cops and as people, first you have to seek to understand, mm -hmm. then try to be understood. Let the person tell you what their issue is. Listen to them, then you can explain to them. Because now you understand exactly what they're trying to tell you. A lot of times we have conversations and the first thing is, let me tell you how we work. And the conversation goes in the wrong direction. Instead of, tell me what your issue is, Ms. Miller. And when you tell me what your issue is, now I can tell you, this is the situation, this is what happened, and this is why it was done this way. But you have to open yourself up to that conversation with people to listen to them. And the police need to listen and the community needs to listen. Okay. Now, where are some good places where that those conversations can happen? Like council meetings or, or something different? Now, council meetings aren't the place because it's, it's too much city business going on. Okay. You have to have meetings that are geared strictly towards this type of conversation. Okay. okay. How, will we, how will you set that up? You can set up your own neighborhood block watch association. Okay. You can reach out to your local police department. It says our neighborhood is having a a meeting and we're talking about we're talking about one arrest in particular or we're talking about the police in particular okay. how you do things how are these things done and there's things the police cannot and will not tell you right. they won't tell you how they did surveillance right okay? they won't and people won't know certain things you'll never know that surveillance was done because the old lady that lives in the corner was sick of the police being there mm -hmm. so she allowed the police officer to come and sit in her kitchen mm. and do surveillance you you're never going to know that Okay. But understand that people are getting arrested and going to jail. What I find amazing is that people will complain about the tactics of police, but they don't complain about the tactics of the drug dealer. Mm, okay. That there's never a complaint about, well, okay. what this guy's doing. This guy is sticking his drugs under Mr. Jo Miss Johnson's siding. Miss Johnson can't even come out of her house and their tactics are changing and destroying the neighborhood. Mm. There's never a complaint about that. Let, let's talk about the tactics of everyone 
and how we can do things better. And, and there are places I've seen it in Patterson that neighborhood block watch associations have taken their blocks back. Okay. You could go to some of the hardest hit wards okay. and the ward may have a decent crime rate, but certain blocks, the crime rate is low. Why? It's because of the people that live on that block. They decided they're not going to do this. They're working with the police. No one will ever know that they're working with the police. Okay. But they're making phone calls and things are getting done. There's a cop or car that comes to my block every day at this time. Okay. And the car sits there and somebody comes and do this. You're never going to know that this is happening. But there are people in the neighborhood that are working with the police to change the neighborhood. We have to do it together. Correct. We can't do it alone or nothing's no. going to get done. Definitely not. That's what detention is all about. All right, so now we're going to open up a little for a little bit of questioning. So if you have a question about the topic, Coptics versus Optics, you are free to unmute yourself, offer a comment or a question. Wow, makes my life easy. I know. Wow, OK. We, well, we I, I would say this. Deal with it, huh? Yeah. I, I would say this so that, you know, just to keep the conversation going. Uh -huh, keep going. If you're not interested in making things better, it's not going to get done. No. Okay. You have to have a real conversation about what is wrong with my community. Right. A part of the problem my community is the police and the way the police are policing. And we need to address that. We also need to address that again. What about the people who are tearing up our community? Mm. Is there a conversation about that? Okay, people like to ask, um, what is the procedure for police under these circumstances? Right. And there has to be uh, policies, there have to be procedures. I agree 110%. What is the procedure for the drug dealer on the corner in front of your house, mm. openly selling drugs? Is there a procedure for that? Mm. You know, is, is that okay? No, it, it can't be okay in our neighborhood. We can't complain about one without complaining about the other. Right. And you go to more affluent towns, the reason you don't have things going on because, and I'm not gonna say whether it's right or wrong, but if I go to a certain town and I'm standing on the corner, mm -hmm. the police are gonna show up and they're gonna ask me in some kind of way, can I help you? Right. Are you from this neighborhood? Because somebody called the police and said I was there. The old lady called the police that there is, and, he, and she said it, there's a black guy in front of my house and he's just standing there. And the police are gonna show up and they're gonna ask me questions. And should that be the case? Probably not. No. But are we doing the same thing in our neighborhood? No. There's a guy sitting or standing in front of my house selling drugs. Are we calling the police? Or are we upset when the police come and grab him and throw him against the wall and search him? We're upset about those things. Right. Okay. Uh, and we should be upset when someone's civil rights are violated. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But if a person just, you know, he's selling drugs and the cop stops him and he talks to him, he interviews him, there's a way to treat people like people. Correct. And in police work, it has to be done. I, I like to use the term um, protect and serve, but the service part is it's like a menu. Mm -hmm. Okay. What service are you asking for? Okay. You ask a police officer for directions. You ask him a question about his job. You ask for his help. You need medical attention. Or you throw a brick through a police officer's window. Mm. Okay. What service do you think you're going to get? Okay. So depending on the service you ask for, it changes on the service that you get. Right. And but, vice versa, the, the police officers are also asking for our assistance. Like if there's something going on in the neighborhood and they start knocking on your doors and we're like, well, we don't want to talk to you. We're not helping. But if we know something, um, we could do that. Like maybe last year sometime there was someone got shot. Well, not someone, but the, the cars got shot. So now the shot happened two cars behind my car. Mm -hmm. So now we heard the shot. We knew that wasn't a firecracker and we did what we need to do in house. And my daughter's like, mom, did you hear that? And I said, yeah, I heard that. She's like, I'm calling the cops. I said, okay. And so they quickly came to our house. So I'm like, well, I guess they, you know, pick up register where the call was coming from. Mm -hmm. And then they were asking us questions. Like, did you see anything or, but we didn't see anything. We just heard it. So they were doing a lot of um, checking 
And apparently there was a lot of cops that came because apparently the block I live on, um, shootings don't normally happen not on the regular basis. They may have had like one or two in the area. So there was a lot more officers there. So that was a difference too, seeing so many officers seeing, but they came very quickly when the call came. Now I wonder sometimes do officers come slowly different areas or quicker as other areas? No, it, it, it has, it has all to do with the calls for service okay. because officers stop what they're doing when their shots are fired. Okay. okay, whatever they're doing, wherever they're coming from, they stop what they're doing. And the, the city has what's called shot spotter. Mm. And shot spotter is a great mechanism. Mm. Okay, There's a round that's fired. The shot spotter goes off in the radio room. It gives you the exact location. Mm of where that job is, I mean, where the shot happened. Shot spotter can tell you one, two, three Broadway in the front of the house or the back of the house. Oh, wow. It can tell you where the shot came from. And unlike regular calls, shot spotter jobs don't necessarily get dispatched. Wow. Okay, it doesn't go in a queue where it's waiting to send a unit. Okay. Okay, the shot is fired, it pops up on the screen and the dispatcher automatically Units, we have a shot spotter activation at one, two, three Broadway. So it's not waiting. No one's waiting. It's not like the, the shots are fired and then it goes in the queue and we're waiting to get to this job. That job goes out right away. So it gets a very, very quick response. So when you're talking police response time and people will say, well, it took the police 20 minutes to get to my house for a block driveway mm. or an hour or average police response time is 20 minutes. Okay. okay. And if, if that's a legitimate time, you have to know that there's sometimes that police are getting to jobs within a minute, mm. within two minutes. There's an officer who says, heck, well, I just heard shots fired around the corner. Headquarters gives it out. A cop is there in less than 30 seconds. But when you average all the jobs out for the city, yes, it can be an average of 20 minutes. Okay. But the most serious jobs are getting a quick response. But again, the words that we're having now, the conversation we're having, this conversation is not being had. If you're not having this conversation with the community, the community has one view of what the police does, mm -hmm. all because the police are not taking the time to talk to them. People don't know about shot spotter. People don't know that these jobs are given out right away. Mm -hmm. They don't know that. They don't know that they think that, well, the shots fired, I call the police and they put it in the system. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. And, and that is the problem that we're not having that conversation with people. And at the same time, if you're on patrol and you're riding around a community and you see the same group of people here, we're all standing on the corner hanging out. The police know us because they come by all the time and they're riding by, they see us. And an hour later, there's uh, a shooting on that corner. And one of the people in this group is laying on a sidewalk. The police officer shows up and said, did anybody see anything? and nobody says a word, mm -mm. okay? Nobody says a word. No. How, do, how would you feel mm -hmm. as a police officer or as a person who you know that you were always here? Right. You were here before, you're here now, and nobody's saying a word, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, granted, you're not gonna say anything right now, but two, three weeks go by, and not one of you have called the police to say, hey, this is who you may wanna look at. Mm. So you want the police to do a full investigation, okay? Put drop everything they have to do this investigation when you're not going to do your part, right. okay? And we talked about before, community policing is you helping the police to help you. Right. That's a big part of it. I see something in the chat. Um, Alfreda Simmons has oh. a question. Go ahead. Go ahead, Alfreda. Yes. So um, just circling back around from your last um, uh, forum that you had regarding pol um, community policing. Yeah. So currently, it's, it's, it's obvious that a lot of people don't feel safe enough or have the police trust um, to let them know what's going on within their community. And last time, the question was, uh, what are police doing now within their community to get to gain the um, their community trust, so um, do you know anything that's happening within you know local um, precincts um, or that's occurring so that 
uh, members within the community can feel safe and trust the uh, police and not feel that how they're just the bad guys. Mm. Well, I, the conversation is taking place across the country. That, and you look at the news and the news is showing that police and community are having real conversations to build that trust. The problem is, I won't say the problem, the situation is trying to build trust with someone who is not legitimately looking to trust you. Mm. Okay, if you really want my trust, let's talk about how I can get your trust, how I can get your trust. Okay. okay. And when you say we're trying to gain the, 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 the community, we're trying to work with the police to gain their trust or so we can get to trust the police. I can't help you to trust all police officers because all police officers aren't the same. All police officers aren't here to do the job the same way. So I can't convince you to trust all police officers. What I can do is try to get you to trust the system. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is, if you see something that you need, or if you know something that you need and you don't see it, build it yourself. But, so then, then, but then let's also talk about this though. So with, with what happened at the Capitol, right? Mm -hmm. We know, and it's, it, was, it was displayed that um, the amount of force that was used to individuals at the Capitol was not the same amount of force that was used when we had um, uh, protesters who were peacefully protesting for the whole Black Lives uh, Matter movement. Mm -hmm. So how can you how can you ask um, the community to gain trust within the, within um, within the police force when situations such as that is occurring? Good it question. It is being broadcast. Good question. Let me ask you this question: uh, Which state are you from? Where I live, I live in Georgia. You live in Georgia. Okay. Based on what happened at the Capitol and the police officers at the Capitol. There's, I have two parts of this. Based on what happened at the Capitol, are you judging the police in Atlanta based on what the police at the Capitol did? Or would you? No, I would not. Okay, so that, that we can say that alone, it separates it. I understand what you, your, your point, but that separates it because you are smart enough not to judge all police based on what those police officers did. Now, this is my opinion. What the police did there is not normal for what police do, okay? And police officers, soldiers follow orders. What were the orders? Mm. That's my so question. So then what was the, so then what's, so then what are the orders that's being displayed when you have officers using um, a, um, a different amount of force on an individual that's making them not breathe in the arrest or um, tasing them or shooting them from behind when they're, you know, they're running from the officer and not using force. And I'm just speaking in general of like different I cases that's- I understand, I understand. Yeah. But I will not co-sign tomfoolery right. or mass jackassery. <laughs> okay. You made I, will, I, will not, I will not co-sign it. I will tell you <laughs> when something is wrong, it's wrong. Shooting a person in the back that's running away from you that has no weapon, that's wrong. I can't, nobody gave you that order. Nobody taught you that. But then overall, it goes into play of us gaining trust within, um, of, our, of our police that, are, that is there to protect and serve our community, not hurt and harm our community. This, this, is, this is where the police have to do their part. And, and again, you want to build a relationship with me. So instead of you asking me, what am I doing to make the relationship better? Because it's obvious I'm not doing anything to make okay. it better, okay? You can see that. What are you willing to do to make the relationship better? Are you willing to invite me to a meeting? Are you willing to invite me to your house or your church so we can have a conversation? So now you get to say, well, I know police officers that don't do this, okay? okay. And that police officer was wrong, but that is not the majority of police officers there are a lot of people, and I, I've learned this, and I find it hard to believe, there are a lot of people who don't have any personal relationships with police officers that That's don't true. have a police officer that they can talk to and ask questions that have never, ever had an incident with a police officer. So a lot of these people don't have these relationships, so they don't have these conversations. So that's what the problem is. But again, to your point, I understand your point. And I said from the beginning, I think that as the police department's job to push this 
at the same thing, at the same time, if I'm not pushing it and you're interested in it, maybe you should push it. Right. Maybe you should try to say, can we get the police to come into a room to talk about some of the things that are happening in our community about the relationship between the police and the community? Why are these things going on? And you'll start to learn that most police officers have a real issue with some of the same things that you have issues with, but you don't have conversation with those people. You have conversations or you see the media talking negative about a certain police encounter. And then they will show you someone else who's saying, I don't see anything wrong with that situation. But what you're not seeing is the police officer who says, I don't agree with that. I, I don't agree with that. You've seen in, in the George Floyd incident, you've seen people who really complained about the incident, how wrong it was. And you've seen people who, I don't know how, tried to say, well, you don't know the whole story. And I'll be the first one to say, I do not know the whole story. What I do know is eight minutes and 46 seconds of the story. And based on that amount of time, something wrong was done. A lot wrong was done. But you don't hear those conversations because nobody's bringing you to the table to have those conversations. And what you can do in your community when these things happen, you could invite the community in to your church, to your neighborhood to have this meeting and say, let's talk about this and find out where the police in our community um, where do they fall on this? And you get a bunch of, you said you're in Atlanta, Atlanta area? Yes. You get, you get a few, you get 15, 20 Atlanta cops that are sitting down talking to you, having coffee and cake, and they're telling you, I disagree with this. Yeah. It helps to change your perception about police officers because now you've had this direct conversation with them. And if you're not having a direct conversation, you assume that all police are thinking the same way when we don't. Exactly. We have another question from D. D. Birch. Go ahead. I see your hand. D. Birch. Yes. Um. I want to go back to what you said when you heard the shots. Yeah. So you said that certain neighborhoods, the neighborhood that you live in, you're not, you don't have gunshots often. Not often. So, right. So when the cops came, they asked you questions. You didn't see anything. You couldn't say anything. No, so what happens when <laughs> right <laughs> so what happens when you go into a neighborhood that is crime infested that most people can't afford to get out so that's the people that they see every single day right. they have to be around it they could trust the police officer but do they trust the people they live around so it's the difference between community policing and being in a neighborhood that you are scared to mm -hmm. even say something when you see something happen right exactly that is that is a great point Yes. Okay. Exactly. But this, this is where you have to find a way to build that organization or you have to build a, a, there has to be a mechanism where the people in these crime written communities, and you make a good point, who can't get out, there has to be a mechanism for them to report things and feel safe reporting things. Right. And one way to do that is you have these community meetings like uh, Ms. Simmons is speaking of. So mm -hmm. you have these meetings. And the officer puts his phone number or the tip line phone number up on the board. Here's the phone number for the tips line. Here's this phone number for narcotics. Everybody writes the phone number down. So when something happens, nobody knows who gave the tip. Right. Versus when I ring your doorbell yeah. and people are standing around and I said, Miss Birch, there was a shooting outside. Did you see anything? And people are looking. You're saying, nope, I didn't see nothing. You're closing your door. You're not going to stand here and talk to me for 10 minutes because they'll know that you're telling. So the, the mechanism has to be built into community policing, into the community where people can feel safe right. complaining about things. And that, again, that's another issue. That's, that's not even about the police. It's about the community feeling safe from other community members. Right. And that mechanism has to be built into this. Otherwise, people aren't going to talk. They like the police, but they got nobody to talk to because I have to live here. Right. I can't come out and Dalton, say. Can yeah. I wait? wait. Go ahead, Kareem. I have a few things going on. Another thing that we can access are organizations. Dalton is the, the president of the Passaic County Brown Shields. We have several um, fraternal organizations that are made up of police officers that you can access. So you might not 
want to go to the precinct directly, mm -hmm. but you can tap into the various organizations and have events with them and invite them to have these conversations and they themselves can take it back to their precincts or to whatever jurisdictions they are. Mm -hmm. So some people might not be comfortable inviting you know, that uniformed officer to the, their community, but the bronze shields will show up in their uh, paraphernalia, and, but they are still representative of law enforcement. So that gives you another avenue okay. to voice your concern, your concerns and have the dialogue that Dalton is talking about. Okay, thank great, you. Great point. Yeah, everyone had good points and questions. And this another, is where it starts. Another question, Linda. Oh, hold on. Helena has her hand up. Okay, go ahead, Helene. Hi, Dalton. How are you? Good. How are you? And I'm good, thanks. And Linda, thank you for having this format. You're I just have a question from an educator standpoint. I want to piggyback off of what Ms. Simmons said and also what the other young lady, Dee Miss Birch, said. When you're trying to engage trust in your community. From an educator standpoint, you know, we've all been home teaching virtually with our students for a whole year. So how do we now teach to our students about, uh -oh. you know, the things that we've been seeing on the news, you know, the overturning at the Capitol, the shootings that happened. How do we now teach our students virtually how to continually trust the officers in the community that they used to see sometimes either as crossing guards or they used to come to their schools for different things. Now, a lot of things in the community have been shut down. Some things are happening, I have heard, but from a teacher's standpoint, when you're in the classroom and we have to bring this up when it comes up, how do we now teach our students, again, how to maintain that trust and open communication with police officers when they see the wrongdoings on TV? How do we handle that as educators? I would say it starts, before it gets to you, it starts with us not telling our kids bad things about police. That, that's where it starts because one of the most trivial conversations that we've probably all seen is a mother in the supermarket or someplace where her child and the child is acting up and the uniformed police officer walks by and the parent says, if you keep acting up, the police officer is gonna take you. That yes, child that. is stuck with that, that image. Too. Now, from the police officer standpoint, you heard that. Right. You have a, this is a perfect time for you to stop what you're doing speak to the child, have a nice encounter. Because if you don't, he's gonna be left with the other image. When you stop and says, hey, how you doing? What's your name? Everything good? Where do you go to school? It's a different image. So we have to stop telling our kids that the police are the bad guy or the boogeyman, because we know, um, and Ms. Birch mentioned it, the boogeyman is probably the person that lives next door and right. not the police. So one is to stop telling our kids those kind of things. Um, some of us remember there was, uh, the great program, the DARE program in the school systems. Those programs don't exist in urban areas because somebody decided that they were nice to have and that you didn't need to have. But those students had conversations that were taught by police officers. Right. They had relationships. They got to see things and learn things. That has been taken away, period, let alone from with the virtual learning. If you make this a part of curriculum, where these students get to spend time with police officers and talk to police officers about the job, things are different because they get to have a positive experience because there's enough ne negative things on TV about police right. and we're not getting in their face, showing them something positive. It's a totally different situation. So you have to take advantage of the situation when you see a, especially a child, Right. okay? But I've done it with adults. You, you take advantage of the situation where you're standing, getting yourself a cup of coffee and a person behind you, hey officer, how you doing? Hey, how are you? And trust me, I'm not interested in talking because I'm trying to get my coffee. And the person may say, listen, thank you for your service. I appreciate it. Because I'm not really looking to get into a conversation. <laughs> However, when I get my coffee, I tell the person behind the counter, um, put their coffee on my bill. Mm. And 
I give the person their coffee. Thank you. Have a nice day. What is that person thinking about when they leave the coffee shop? You did something gonna, nice. I did something nice. What's going to happen? They may not say it today, but what's going to happen two weeks from now when they're in a conversation and people are talking about the police and the police did this and the person may say, well, you know what? I mean, I've seen some bad cops, but last week there was a cop at the coffee shop and he bought me a cup of coffee. Right. So as police officers, we have to take advantage of the opportunity to do something nice for someone. And um, I'm, I'm trying to keep my attention, but I see somebody with electric blinds. That's shit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, it's, it's, you have to take advantage of the opportunity to do something nice for people. Right. So we have to change the narrative on both ends. We have to just change, start changing the narrative. And as we have the conversation, start applying what we're learning and to make things better. But you, and Linda, at, with that, police officers have to be given the power to do well, that's true, things. too. You okay. only can do what you're allowed to do. Yes. If your boss will pull pull, pull your coattail and say, no, I didn't actually do that. That's not your job. Your job is to do this. So we we have to start understanding that there is a rank and file. You know, and, and, it, and it has to be it has to be pushed down from the top because right. in suburban communities, it is pushed down. Okay, right. there are some suburban communities where the community can call and say, hey, this is Mr. Price. I'm going on vacation and I need for the officer to put my recycling out next Wednesday. Right. And oh. it happens because that's what they're supposed to do. I mean, they're, they're, okay. not, fighting, they're, not, they're not fighting crime <laughs> at the same time. But those are t there's places that this happens wow. versus you come to an urban area and you do that. The police are busy fighting crime. So right. that's not going to happen the same. We don't have time to put your garbage out. That's not what we do. But we do have to find a place where officers are taught from the top, from the beginning, that it's very important that you engage in conversation right. with the community. And this is your responsibility. I want to know that you're doing more than just locking people up. Okay, that's, that's a very important part of the conversation. But if you're not saying that, trust me, it's not getting done. Okay, Ms. Birch? Okay, so like I like that you said that they need to train the officers. So what do you what is your take about the pastor that in I think it was Colleen, Texas, um, that was killed by the police officer that he had the mental health issues? Did you see that video? I did not. I okay, did not. so there was a there was a pastor. Um, I guess he was having some mental illness issues. <laughs> Oops, sorry. I guess you got mental health police officers that you can call and they come out. So the previous day. A mental health police officer was called out and they dealt with him. They took him to the mental health facility. He was released and he came back home. So the next day, I guess he was having another episode. So they sent the, the mental health officers wasn't available. So they sent a regular cop. Yes, I agree that the person, the guy was a little hostile, but everyone knew that he had mental issues. The family was, you see on camera saying, please don't shoot him. You know, he's having an ep episode. We've been calling. They didn't have anyone to come out. So I guess the cop felt threatened because it was, he was a small white guy. The cop was a small white guy. The guy was a, a big black guy. And he ended up shooting and killing the guy. Right. Okay. So okay. what are your thoughts about police officers being trained on handling situations like that? I agree 110%. I think officers should be trained on crisis intervention. I have crisis intervention training. I also have self-defense training and I have crisis intervention training. I also have use of force training and I have crisis intervention training. I have deadly force training and I have crisis intervention training, okay? And I'm gonna use the tool that works and we're gonna start with the least tool that we have. So you start with crisis intervention. And if that doesn't work, I may have to go hands-on and then we may try crisis intervention again that may not work I may have to use mace so one thing is very important to understand and I'm going to just say it okay and somebody may down the line may have an issue with it especially people in the mental health field which I, I deeply appreciate your mental health issue is not more important than my life or my safety so number one, I need to be trained to deal with you in the proper manner. But at any given point that my safety or my life is in danger, your mental health issue is really not 
my issue. I mean, I, 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 it sounds harsh, but the fact that I have a mental health problem and I have a knife in my hand, if the person on the other side of the table is supposed to say, I'm gonna allow this to happen to me because he has a mental health issue. It doesn't work that way. Now, I don't know the video. I don't know the story. I don't know if something different could have been done, but I think every officer, and, and, and this is where the, um, the nice to have is done, the camouflage. We're gonna give you a certain amount of mental health officers to do the job. And when something happens, we're gonna call those mental health officers. Remember that the mental health officer is a police officer. He brings all those trainings and all those tools with him. So at any given time, this situation can go bad and the officer may have to shoot someone. The idea is to give all of the officers the mental health training that they need so that they can use those tools in these situations. So hopefully you can avoid those issues. And let me say this real quick, Ms. Birch. We have an issue in Patterson where a police officer was involved in a shooting of a person with, a, with mental illness. And then the conversation came up that there are pe police officers are shooting people that have mental illness. So I had to pull the numbers to see what the numbers look like. That year, the police department had about 1,600 calls for service for people which we did at that time considered EDPs, emotionally disturbed. 1,600 calls for service. Out of 1,600 calls for service, five of those people actually went to jail. The rest of those people either were left at home or went to the hospital to get the help that they needed. Now, nobody's gonna talk about the other 1,600. They're gonna talk about the five or they'll talk about the one that was killed, okay? The one that was killed was shot by a female police officer. He was much bigger than she was. He was coming after her and the shooting happened, okay? It does happen, but there's so many calls for service where people with mental illness are being helped by police or EMS. They're getting a service that they need and those conversations are never, never heard. And this is the issue with body cams that it shows these issues, but it's not showing the other side. And you can't just say the police killed a person that had a mental illness problem. It's more to it than that. What was the situation? Okay, we're gonna put a pin right there. And this is concluding part one. So I hope to see you next Friday, same time, same place for cultural competency so we can continue the conversation. So I hope to see everyone here. I enjoy seeing your beautiful faces tonight. Um, on the call with me and on the call with Dalton. Um, so bring your questions, bring your concerns. And um, we have one more. <laughs> Hold on. Go ahead, Ms. Price. Ms. Price, you had your hand up. Okay, yes. I see that you have it listed on Facebook, but um, you didn't put the Zoom number in. So okay. people didn't know to you to that they can watch it by Zoom. Because they were supposed to Facebook. register by the email. On the fly, oh, okay. they had to go to the email and then the Zoom link would come there. Oh, okay. Right. All right then. So Thank if you, you can let those people know who had difficulties, just to go to the email and they would get the link. Oh, okay. Thank I you. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you. So once again, thank you, everyone. Dalton, you have any last words? Before uh, no, I want to say hi to Calvin first. Hey, Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate the candidness, but the questions that are coming up here, these are the kind of questions that people have. And if you're not having this kind of dialogue, the community doesn't know. Ms. Birch is asking a question about something that happened recently. Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of things that need to be addressed so people can get some information. Otherwise, she walks away with her own opinion right. about police or the situation. And the media is going to show you a quick clip of whatever happened. And they're going to make the, the, the point of a person with mental illness was shot and killed by a police officer. Right. That's it. Even Ms. Birch added in that, yes, the police officer was a smaller white guy and the person with the mental illness was a bigger black guy. Right. Media is not going to tell you that. Media is going to make you make this against about the police, against a person with mental illness. And again, my life is important. I want to go home. My health is important. And I promise you, if you don't try and hurt me, I will not hurt you. Right. But if the situation changes, I have tools. Again, crisis intervention, 
and conversation, crisis intervention, use of force, crisis intervention, deadly force. All these things are in that criteria and we're gonna use that as best we can to help the person that needs help. And thank you all for joining. I appreciate it. I look forward to a part two. very spirited conversation next time around. Yes, part uh, two next Friday, six o'clock. We'll be here. All right, folks, have a good night. All right, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.